It is Tuesday, April 9th. Welcome inside the vault. I'm Bobby Trossett, joined by my co-host and partner, Sarah Ellison. We would call this a Ravens lunch hour live stream, but technically, I guess unless you're on maybe mountain time right now or an early West Coast time, it's 1.30 Eastern. So we're a little bit off. Maybe some of you are. It's, it's still in your lunch break, but we had to push it back an hour today because of the annual pre-draft Ravens press conference, which of course gets ready and anticipates and prepares for the upcoming 2024 NFL draft. This has been commonly known in recent years, Sarah, as the Liars Luncheon. So we're going to sift through everything that we just listened to throughout the course of the I don't think it went a full hour, but uh, close to it. we got a lot of content to get to. Before we get into the rundown of what we have coming up, it would mean the world if you guys would come out to our inaugural, that's right, not first ever, inaugural, for those of you who Check my grammar on that that phrase. Our our inaugural marathon draft party live stream at Baltimore's downtown soundstage in the Inner Harbor. We are thrilled to be partnering with our first ever legitimate concert hall venue. And it's Thursday, April 25th, coinciding with the opening night of the draft. Seven o'clock, the doors open. 40 bucks gets you inside. That includes premium tailgate buffet provided by our friends at Clean Cuisine. It will be live streamed on YouTube. Ticketmaster tickets are available right now. We have um, that link included in the show notes below. Sarah's flying in from Columbus for this event, and I know it's starting to become real. So we got a lot of prep work to do between now and then, but we hope we hope as many of you will come out. Uh, those of you who are in the area, it, it mean a lot to us. So we hope, and I can't wait to see you come out to Baltimore again, partner. Get your tickets. Let's go. Just click on it right now. Get your tickets and meet us there draft night. Let's go. So in terms of what we have coming up for you in this live stream, John Harbaugh made a pretty big, bold statement about the 2024 season. Eric DaCosta talked about the state of the team overall and then proceeded to go meticulously (laughs) position by position in terms of his evaluation, which is ongoing throughout the course of the next few days before they have, of course, the 30th overall selection in the opening round. They talked a little bit about Trenton Simpson and his development as a Year two, almost redshirt, if you will, rookie year, standing behind and sitting behind Patrick Queen. And some fifth-year option decisions way and, and loom for Rashad Bateman and Adafi Owe and a number of other things, including some of the questions that weren't asked at the press conference that if we had a chance to be there, we definitely would have wanted to get down to the bottom of. But we'll begin with this. And you see the quote up on the screen. For those of you in the audio-only crowd, John Harbaugh was quoted for, well, We'll get to what we what he had to say in just a second. Here he is in his press conference. And the goal is to be in, all in, to the question, every single year, as best as you can be. You can't just be, oh, we're going we're gonna to put all our chips on the table this year, next year we're going to fold and not play any games. No, we're going to try to win the championship every single year, as many games as we can. And it's the sum of the parts that we put together and what we build around those guys and go out there and play on Sundays and lay it all out there, you know, and with a bunch of fans yelling and screaming in the background to support your football team. That's what we're all about. That's what football is. It's not just a math equation. It's, it's more than that. And that's what makes it so exciting and so interesting. And we're going to have a heck of a team next year. You wait. You watch. You wait and see what we do. So that was a 40-second clip from, I think I cut it down from like over two minutes, Sarah, in response to essentially what they've lost. Right, what's walked out the door this offseason? And it was actually the first part of the question was about Malik Cunningham. Yeah, no, that's the thing is like this was (laughs) unprompted. He went on a two minute rant where he was answering a question about Malik Cunningham, which we will get to. But somebody else had asked Harbaugh, I mean, Eric DaCosta, several questions beforehand like, are you guys all in? Like, quote unquote, all in, Mm -hmm. all in because uh, Jerry Jones had said that, right? Or you'll see. And, and Eric kind of is like, we're always all in. You should know that Jerry. Cause it was Jerry Coleman who asked it. He's like, you, you should know we're always all in. We don't. And, and then, so Harbaugh is kind of quiet to the side. Cause the, the comment wasn't for, or the question wasn't for him, but he clearly was passionate about it for sure. To like bring it up uh, during this two minute rant. And Bobby, I kind I, I agree. I think this is more than coach speak because I mean, we're going to have a heck of a team this year. You wait, you watch. How many times have we been saying is people have been, some people, not everybody, but a portion of the fan base is hitting the panic button, right? That you've lost about a dozen different free agents. 
And it's not fun to watch Patrick Queen walk out the door or, uh, you know, Clowney or uh, Darby or any of these guys. It's not fun. But we've been talking all, all off season how it's the blue chip players. And then you got to, you got to, there's, there's guys out there that can supplement your blue chip players. Ravens have about eight of them. Yep. And that's what you need to win a championship. So to me, I agree. Now, you, it still doesn't mean you didn't miss an opportunity last year because you had an opportunity and you never know what is going to happen in the injury department. But if they have another year where they don't have major injuries, I agree with them. I think the Ravens are going to have a heck of a team in 2024. Sure. And Eric was quick to say, right, and we're going to get to these uh, a couple of these snippets, a lot of the contributing players weren't even on the team this time last year. Right. So there's a lot of work to do between that. What was the quote that he said? Like, we don't, we don't work for, for May. We work for September or something yep. along those lines. Like, yep. and that's true. Like bringing in Kyle Van Noy in September off the couch to get nine sacks from him a few months later shows you patience. Jadavian Clowney coming in over the summer during training camp and him having a career year. Those are two career years right there from a pass rush standpoint. And we haven't even mentioned the Darbies of the world. He did. <laughs> he mentioned your guy. Well, he I, sure know did. You're, I know you're pumping your fists, right? You but know, Arthur Mollet you deserves some love. You're on the same page. Let's give some love within that category to Arthur Mollet too as well. But, uh, but yeah, he, as soon as he said Darby and singled him out, I'm like, oh, she's pumping her fist <laughs> at home right now for sure. For sure. So, uh, so anyway, here's something that you transcribe. We'll go big screen for this, and I'll let you take it. Yeah. On so this Eric was, Costa. This was the question about like losing, you know, over a dozen players in free agency, and are you all in? And and for how for how passionate Harbaugh just got, uh, EDC got, you know, EDC passionate here, and he's like, we're in the same place that we were in last year at this time. I mean, go back and read what some of you wrote last year and see where we ended up. So he's like challenging, you know, the the media members there. What did you guys say about us last year? They like, do read it. Uh, oh, of course they do. I mean, I was an intern and I, and I put together you know. the clips. Yeah, you I mean, we had it. to divvy it out. We took it upstairs. We gave it to the coaches. And, <laughs> and all, yeah, they read it because it's the PR's team to make sure they're, you know, on top of what's being said about them. Um, now do they read all these comments in social media? Probably not, but they read what the media is saying. And, um, and by the way, actually last year at this time was probably worse. Did we, well, no, I, well, it depends on when you count Easter, right? Because Easter is when they signed, uh, Odell Beckham Jr. But Easter came much earlier this year. So if you were talking just calendar, I mean, not right. Easter, but the date, like the Ravens still don't have OBJ. They still don't have Lamar at this time last year. So right. Ravens are light years ahead by just having Lamar. So anyway, sure. he goes on to say, quote, we have a lot of time to make moves. A lot of the players that we lost, excellent players. A lot of these guys were acquired in August and September, to your point, Bobby. He goes on to say, so we're still building. And a big part of that is going to be through the draft. And then he goes on and says, but guess what? We're also, we're always looking at trades. He's like, we're bringing guys in for visits. He's talking about free agency. He's like, you know, all of that. We're still, that's still going to be a big part of it. And he says, quote, I think we're just getting started. The destination is September, not May. Close quote. And Aha, that's what it was. The destination. Destination. Yeah. Okay. Destination. And it is funny, Bobby, because it, it, at one point, John Harbaugh, and it was in that rant that we kind of cut out a little bit because it really was going on for a while. But he said in there, he's like, we get asked the same questions in here. Right. And he's been doing it for, I don't know, how long has he been head coach? Like 18 years at this point? Harbs? Yeah. I think last year was 16. Oh, okay. Gave him two extra years. Um, well, okay. Going into 17. I'm not that far off. All right. Give myself. Not at all. Yeah. All right. I'm close. I'm close. Okay. <laughs> and it's true. And, and I feel like covering the team since 2005, while I'm not taking the perspective of the questions I'm getting, I see. Every single year, the exact same freak out among a portion of the fan base in March when the Ravens are losing their free agents and, um, and not necessarily spending and not and not necessarily spending. Sometimes they do. Most times they don't. Most times it's like what we just saw. They pick and they pick one guy and yep. then they're quiet. And then sometimes the Marcus Williams the of the world. Yeah. The, 
you know, Marcus was an outlier, right? Derek wasn't necessarily based on the running back market this year. But for the Ravens, it was somewhat. I mean, they still waited. Like, Derrick Henry was still, like, the eighth running back signed. Something crazy like that. Right, right. So, anyway, I just, I, like, could feel Harbaugh there because I feel like being the media and being that they can't directly talk to this team, they'll talk to media media members. Mm -hmm. And just every year there's a March freakout. And every year, I mean, you don't like to hear it, but it's like, guys, we're, like, five months away from, from the season. It's going to be all right. And oh, by the way, what you don't, what we all don't see is what the, the, the draft from two years ago, three years ago, four years ago is now going to finally produce, whether it's the Ben Cleveland's of the world or Andrew Voorhees or uh, Trenton Simpson or the, you know, who, whoever it may be, like we're not taking into account because they've been quiet for two or two or three years as, as depth. We don't know what they know and what they see on who's ready to take the next step. They know Trenton Simpson better than us. They know they know Voorhees better than us. They know Cleveland better than us. We we haven't seen him. And so they have that in their calculus where we don't because we don't see it. Two of those three names that you just mentioned, Trenton Simpson and Andrew Voorhees, were mentioned specifically based mm -hmm. on questions asked by Eric DaCosta, and that'll – Segue us perfectly into the position by position evaluation that Eric took us on, which was a meticulous way to go about some of their needs. We'll get to that in just a second. But before we do, this episode has been brought to you by our friends and is being brought to you by our friends at Primary Residential Mortgage. And Sarah, there, there they go again with their their photoshopping skills. That is not my body, just so you know. That is not my body. But they want to know, uh, do you feel like you missed the boat on low rates maybe in 2020? 2021 due to the pandemic. If that's the case, don't wait for another crisis to expect similar rates. Act now so you can avoid missing out on current opportunities. Home buyers wait waiting for tomorrow's lower rates may miss out on today's prices. Prices are rising steadily, and if rates drop and demand spikes, prices could surge. Plus, should rates fall, you can always refinance with primary residential mortgage. And right now, they're featuring an exclusive incentive for both the Vault subscribers, Bobby Baltimore subscribers, those of you who follow us on all platforms. Until July 1st of 2024, PRMI is covering the cost of your appraisal up to 550 bucks. In order to redeem that, you can apply through the PRMI Mid-Atlantic website. Just mention our name, either one of our names, and you can find that in the show notes below. That link, I should say. Explore PRMI's programs designed to assist both first-time and repeat home buyers, regardless of the rate environment. You can contact them today to discuss your options. PRMI is an equal housing lender, NMLS ID 3094. So, first of all, Eric DaCosta mentioned that uh, it is indeed grind time. He's, the team spent all day yesterday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. reviewing the offensive linemen in this draft class, which we'll get to in just a second. But let's actually begin with John Harbaugh kind of catching everybody up to speed on something that reporters followed up on from what he mentioned during the owners' meetings in Orlando a week or two ago. And that was about number eight's input on wide receivers. And I'll let you take this since you transcribed it. <laughs> so, yeah, I thought this was interesting um, because we, as we've talked about on the show before, uh, we've seen the impact Lamar has on the wide receivers that the Ravens either sign or draft Zay Flowers, Hollywood Brown, OBJ. Uh, and who knows, who knows if he had a hand in, in Nelly, who knows that, that Florida connection, but they asked him, okay, what about Lamar's input into this year's drafting wide receivers? Harbaugh says, we talked right after the season about the type of guy, the type of role that he thought would fit. We were all on the same page with that part of it. Bobby, pause for, and not the, uh, not the pause that people use, the kids use these days, but just pause on reading this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but um, the, the, um, uh, they're talking about an X right here, right? They gotta be, because you have the smaller shifty guy with Zay, you've got Nelly and, and Bateman who can kind of, can kind of play that X role. Uh, and so, but that big, big body type, I'm, my guess is when he's saying the type of guy, that's who I think they're think, talking about. Oh, and yeah. the reason, another reason why I think that is just what we discussed yesterday is based on uh, who they've brought in, 
which are bigger body guys to come work out and Jeremy Fowler's kind of, uh, uh, report that they're looking for those big bodied X receivers. So that's my guess of who they talked about with Lamar, just like the type. Okay. And he goes on. Okay. Glad we're on the same page. All right. Quote, but it doesn't always work out that way. Can't always get exactly the type of guy you want. So Lamar has been tasked over the text world (laughs) with a couple of assignments. Because remember, Sarah, this time last year, we learned that all he really communicates to these guys, whether it's the general manager or the head coach during that negotiation process was via text. That was part of like the the weird generation difference between these guys, right? Like I would think that Eric and John would just rather hop on the phone, but Lamar did most of his business via text last year, which was (laughs) was a very interesting wrinkle. It's $250 million contract all done via text. text. Exactly. I feel like John has like already moved over into that text world because he's been with the players, whereas EDC <laughs> is usually communicating with agents. Yeah. So it might have been more of an adjustment adjustment for EDC. But right. anyway, so he says we've we, over the text world. Just that alone lets you know he's not used to it. Over the text world, it immediately brought me back to last year when they <laughs> talked about it. You yeah. know, because they were they were asked about so much of the nuance of of that negotiation. Yeah. So. So I never text about it. Anyway, so he asks them, he gives them a couple of assignments. Then he says, so we'll see who he likes. He looks at guys on tape. I can just see Lamar now looking at the tape. Okay. He looked because they give him the iPad and I'm sure they just like, you know what I mean? You know how they, in the iPad, they like after games, they immediately load the iPad with all the plays from the games. Nope. I'm sure the video tech guys on the football side loads all the coaches and everybody's either iPads or computers with all the pertinent tape that's needed for each draft prospect, right? So they're not hunting it down. So they're like, all right, let's send Lamar. Here's who's who, here's who we like mm-hmm. uh, or more, you know, and send him to Lamar's iPad and let him. That's how I envision it. I could be wrong, but that's kind of how I envision it. Uh, so we'll see who he likes. He looks the guys on tape and he's never been shy about giving his opinion on free agents or the draft. Then he says he hasn't weighed in quite yet. We're almost two weeks out. Then Harbaugh goes, but he will. So that's where we're at with Lamar Jackson input on wide receivers. Okay. And this is where we're at in terms of depth by position with some of the key needs in terms of Eric DaCosta's evaluation, one of which is, of course, wide receiver. I I think offensive line is pretty stacked across the board in most rounds. I think receiver is is a really deep draft this year. Um. You know, those would be two. I think, you know, I mentioned running back. I think that you'll see a lot of running backs get drafted probably starting in the third round, you know, through the seventh. You'll see a, a lot of guys get picked. Um, you know, those would be positions that when I look at the assess the draft, I think are pretty deep positions in the draft this year. We'll revisit that running back comment in just a bit here mm-hmm. because uh, he made a pretty, I don't know about a bold statement, but suggested something about the running back position that we'll revisit and we'll revisit this slide too as we segue from wide receiver to offensive line and as i mentioned a minute ago sarah eric said that the team spent all day yesterday from 9 a.m to 6 p.m reviewing the offensive linemen in this draft class here's john harbaugh talking about it yeah absolutely it's going to be competitive there's going to be a competition for those spots i mean the best whoever plays the best we always say who's the best player it's the player who plays the best, you know, and you could have been the best player five years ago, but you're not the best player now. So uh, every day you go out to practice, every game you play, there's an accumulated um, uh, established aspect of it. But right now we're a little more open. So those guys that you're talking about are going to be competing with whoever comes in here and we'll just see who does it. But I think those guys are ready to compete and do well and they'll be in here Monday. Can't wait to see them. It's going to be great to see those guys in here Monday working hard and See what happens. Okay, so a couple things on this. So DaCosta is saying that they spent yesterday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. reviewing the offensive line. He was clear. He was like, just so you know, we didn't spend all the time on that because it's a great need for us. He goes, it is a great need. But the reason why we had to spend that much time is because of how deep it is. So he was like, if there were only so many draftable offensive linemen, maybe they could have done from 9 a.m. to lunchtime, right? But it's so deep that they literally had to spend the whole day in their in their draft meetings. And this is usually the, the wall, time man. of year, by the way, where they fly in all their area scouts 
okay, right. from across the country. And then they're literally in the same room and kind of like, uh, what's the word for it? I, I almost want to say fight it out, but that's not quite like that's Debrief? but that's, like they're debating, like they're trying yeah. to set their board. So he's saying by the, he said by the end of this week, we should have our board completely set. And then we'll know we'll have our roadmap to to who we're going to pick at number 90. Yeah. But when they go in there, they are they're They're like fighting for their guys. Right. So if you have a scout who's from who's been watching teams in the southwest, right, looking California or Arizona and all down there, they're going to come be like, I've been watching this guy. And then you got like right. a Northeast scout and he's like, no, 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 no. I got this guy. And then they're kind of like, uh, everybody is expected to, to like fight for the people in their, in their areas or, or say, yeah, no, this guy's not it. Right. I've been watching him. He's, he's not a Raven type thing. So so anyway, point being, when you have all these scouts come in from throughout the country and then you spent a whole day on offensive linemen, that means there was a lot of quality, draftable offensive linemen to go through. Man, this is where we can really lean on, you know, former Raven scout now and NFL Network draft analyst Dan Daniel Jeremiah's storytelling, because that's been my gym soundtrack yeah. over the last couple of weeks. And I know you're with me on this. And just this morning, he and Bucky were kind of talking about how Sometimes you can second guess yourself this time of year because of the influence of what's around you. You're, you're outlining this, this room. Like if we can all visualize this room with all the different area scouts that don't, they're on the road all the time. Yeah. So they're not, they're not in, not everybody's in the same room all that often. And so all of a sudden you get all these different opinions being weighed in. Are you going to stick to your guns about a certain player that you feel really good about your evaluation? Or are you going to, are you going to break? Are you going to be flexible? I thought to be a fly on the wall in those yeah. rooms with the amount of, of football acumen and knowledge. Oh yeah. Institutional knowledge in, in a sense too. Yeah. But also the, those who have been there, done that, like Eric can't look at every single one of these guys, the way that his, his area scouts that he leans on can. So, I was going to say, he looks at every single one. But in the way that his, his Sorry, aerial yeah. scouts can, yeah, 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 in person, yeah the, like, but the, but yeah, like he hasn't he hasn't watched them in person in games like right. the way the area scouts have. Right. Um, the other thing in the in the quote in the soundbite that you played of John Harbaugh, so he was asked specifically about from Jeff Zwieback, like, do you feel like there are guys already on the roster who could start? And he's yeah. like, yeah, but it's going to be a competition. But here's the way I'm going to be looking at it, and maybe. Maybe it changes a little bit based off of the depth in this class. But to me, it's like guys that have been in the system, such as Ben Cleveland, let's take him. It's going to be his fourth year. Is there going to be a guard that you can draft? Sure, if you drafted a guy in the first round, which I don't, I don't know. I'd be a little bit surprised if they drafted a guard in the first round. They've done it. Um, but outside of a first round guard, I have a hard time thinking they're going to find somebody in like the third round that's going to beat out Ben Cleveland in year one. You know what I mean? That's why to me, it's like, regardless of who they draft, you'd think that Ben Cleveland would be the favorite going in. Now, that being said, if it's as deep as they say, maybe that blows that theory out of the water, right? Maybe, maybe because it's so deep, you know, a third round guy in his rookie year could really push Cleveland. You know, now I do think there'd be more legitimate competition on the left side with like Voorhees and whoever else, because yeah. the, the candidates there are still a little bit younger. It's not like they're going into the fourth year, but, um, but I still with out outside of a first round offensive lineman, I would still think it would be an uphill climb for a drafted guard to win the position, you know, week one. Be awfully week disappointing one. for Ben. You know, yeah, to be, to be involved in the program for that long, and to lose your start your starting spot, which we're yeah. all kind of penciling in, right? Let's let's face it, we're all kind of penciling in Ben as one of the starting guards. I am the other guy who could potentially be there. The aforementioned Andrew Voorhees was uh, they they pinpointed him specifically, and Eric has been watching him for sure throughout his ongoing rehab. Yeah, well, uh, I, I did that just because I knew all you guys wanted to go home, and so I was hoping to catch you guys as you were leaving the facility so you'd all have to. Let me clarify so you guys aren't confused. <laughs> <laughs> he 
Set some, the clip of these, up. some of these need to be set up perfectly. <laughs> so remember, they traded back into the seventh round after they had already done their post-game draft press conference a year ago to go and get the USC guard, uh, Andrew Voorhees. So they were kind of revisiting that decision. They thought they were done, or we all thought they were done. The Ravens had other plans. Sorry about that. Yeah, well, uh, I, I did that just because I knew all you guys wanted to go home, and so I was hoping to catch you guys as you were leaving the facility so you'd all have to come back and cover the draft. Um, but no, seriously, um, you know, Andrew was a guy that, that I had seen on tape, and I thought that he was a good player and that he would have a chance long-term to be a player for us and be a starter for us, potentially. A uh, physical, tough guy that loves football. Um, so, you know, we were just sitting there, and we hadn't made a trade. And he was still available, and I just had this idea that if we, because we, because we had already had our kind of end, end of the day press conference, and I was watching, and I thought I was going to go upstairs and just call the, uh, I ended up being Andrew Barry, which typically we wouldn't do a lot of trades with in, in divisional opponents, but uh, he was happy to do it, and so it made all all the sense in the world for us to do it. So. It just seemed to me that we would get some value with him as a player, that had he been in the draft and been healthy, he'd have been a higher pick. And I saw ability potentially for him to be a starter at guard in the league. So we'll see. He's, he's done a fantastic job with rehab. He's very, very strong and physical, if you guys have seen him. Uh, the strength coaches and the trainers and the doctors are all very excited about him. And so we'll see what he does. Eric, um, I think. Promising. There you go. You know, like I, I thought he had starter ability. So we're going to, we're going to find out. Continues so, to be promising. Very, very promising. What about right. the cornerback class? That's what I was going to say. Let's move on to cornerback class. Now this one, he basically said that they're average, <laughs> but basically guaranteed that they're going to pick somebody. So yeah. that's actually the word he used though. Average. Well, let's hear it. <laughs> Here it is. Uh, you know, I think it's a, a solid class. Certainly probably not at the level of the uh, receiver and offensive line. Uh, you know, very cyclical. But definitely some players who can come in right away and probably compete to start for us. Um, we would love to add a talented corner at some point in the draft, whether that's first round or second round, third round, whatever that might be. A talented player who can help us. That's a position, as you all know, that you know typically you never have enough due to injuries and different things. The guys will break down throughout the course of the season. I think our depth has always been tested in the secondary. This year was no exception, and we were we were blessed to have some guys like, for instance, Ronald Darby come in and and really help us. And so, yeah, if we have a chance to draft a corner this year, you can you can count on us doing that. And let me just clarify: it was the edge rusher. Edge rusher. Uh, class edge that rusher you was, to this one. Average. This one was solid. Solid. So it's solid. the edge rusher class. Excuse me. There. That's average. Yeah. Solid, but not at the the depth of of offensive line and wide receiver. So, uh, no. This is this is exactly why I wanted to get Ronald Darby back. Is is his point? Is like there is something about cornerbacks. They're kind of like these these track stars, right? That just break down a little bit, you know, throughout throughout this the season. If they don't have like a serious injury, it seems like there's always like a hamstring pull, like yeah. a calf or something, you know? And so they do like, I, I, I just don't know what you can get out of J Jalen armor Davis because he, Good to question. the, to this whole thing is like, he hasn't been healthy. I don't know what you can get out of Pepe Williams, which is they double dipped that year when they got both of those guys because he hasn't stayed healthy. And I mean, it's, you know, you've got Stevenson and Humphrey to start Arthur Millette, great re-signing, uh, love his attitude. And then, you know, Trayvon Mullen, Kadar Holm, they got to add to it. They got to add to it. So they call this a liar's luncheon. There's probably a couple lies in there, but, but there's a lot of truth there. I mean, he, if he, he needs to, he needs to get a cornerback. He needs to yes. get a cornerback. They need depth. They need depth. They need depth. Due to Keaton Mitchell's uncertainty around what his rehab is coming back from last year's late season injury, uh, the running back class is definitely going to be something that the Ravens are looking at and probably are going to have to address at some point. And Eric didn't shy away from saying kind of exactly that. I think so. I mean, you know, I think it was an interesting dynamic this year uh, in free agency. You, you saw whatever it was, maybe nine or ten guys 
get signed on the first day of free agency. And I think part of that was probably, you know, how people looked at this running back class in the draft. There's no, like, top-tier first-round necessarily type talents this year. Uh, that being said, there's a lot of guys, if you're looking at the, the, the prospects in the second, third, and fourth round, there's a lot of those guys, particularly third, fourth, fifth round clumps. So uh, we've looked at those guys very closely. We're excited about some of those players. You know, there's probably a pretty strong chance we will draft a running back at some point, um, you know, round to obviously to be determined. Uh, but we do think there's a chance for us to get a good young player who can help us in, in different ways as a running back in the passing game and also on special teams. A pretty strong chance there, Sarah. Pretty strong. Of course chance. they're going to draft a running back. They have to. <laughs> they, they don't. They don't have anybody healthy beyond um, Justice Hill and and Derrick Henry. Derek. You you yep. need you need depth. You you absolutely need depth. So of course they're going to. And I also think they're probably going to add some undrafted rookies. Yep. Sure would be nice if they could repeat. You know the the success they had with Keaton Mitchell. Uh, but yeah, of of course, of course they're going to draft a running back. They they have to. How about inside linebacker? Life after Patrick Queen. Eric DaCosta was asked about. Trenton Simpson, the second-year player out of Clemson that the Ravens are really high on, so much so that there's almost this expectation that uh, you know not only is he going to kind of be plug-and-play, but he's going to be that guy from the jump. Here's EDC. Well, first, we were very excited to bring Kyle back. You know, it was a great experience for us last year with Kyle, and I think... Uh-oh, Kyle Van Noy. I'm jumping out ahead here. <laughs> first, I think, you know, Trenton is going to have a great season. He's great attitude. I think he grew as much as anybody this year. It's tough, you know, for young players. Um, he, he showed up on special teams. When he played on defense, he made some plays late in the year. Got a lot of talent. I mean, he's as talented as any inside linebacker in this year's draft class, for sure. So excited about him. Uh, I think we've got some other young players um, that, you know, can emerge as well that we're excited about uh, at that position. The draft, we've looked at some guys, definitely some talent in this year's draft class. Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a, it's a pretty good cl- – there's no, like, top 10 probably inside linebackers in this draft class, but there's a lot of depth in the second and third and fourth rounds. And so certainly a position we'll look at, particularly if they can play on special teams and help us that way too, which is a really important part of the inside linebacker position evaluation-wise. Um, but we like our young guys that we have, excited about those guys, and, uh, and we'll see how the whole thing kind of plays out. So, Trenton, just to remind everybody, he was a third-round pick a year ago, 86 overall out of Clemson. And we all remember when that kind of came down, what that probably meant at that moment and ended up becoming for Patrick Queen's future in Baltimore. Yeah, so this – I liked I liked his answer on this. Um, and, again, this is so easy to know what – not easy, but generally speaking, you can figure out whether they're lying or telling the truth. This is what he's telling the truth on also. Yeah. And you know he's telling the truth because they let Patrick Queen go. And then yep. I had seen that um, that fan account, Ravens Nation Live, had pulled out out of a Jeff's Rebeck story that said that Jeff's Rebeck said the Ravens made, quote unquote, no effort to re-sign Patrick Queen. Hmm. And it's like, well, duh. Yeah. Of course, like, we know the Ravens have been telegraphing this. <laughs> For a year. Since, for a year. <laughs> Patrick Queen knew. We all knew. Why is this news? This is obvious. And the and one of the reasons that they made no effort is because he believes what he just said. Now, whether or not, whether or not that's gonna his prediction and his projection comes to fruition, we'll find out. Mm-hmm. But he said, well, first of all, Trenton Simpson is a great player he's backing that those words up with action and um he backed it up with that lone lone game that he got um in pittsburgh aside from special teams right he he looked like a dog that game he did and listen we're gonna have to give him grace even though even though we all believe in him and we're projecting him to be good uh, like there's gonna have to be some grace he's not gonna be pro bowler or he, I'll say it, he's unlikely to be Pro Bowl or Patrick Queen. So as good as as he is projected to be, and he's going to have his mistakes, sort of rookie mistakes, since it will kind of be a rookie year for him, being a full time starter. But 
um, they 1000% believe in him. And that is why they made no effort to go and re-sign Patrick Coyne. They also believe in Kyle Van Noy, who, as we know, signed a two-year extension last week back on the other side of 30. He's 33 now, still playing really good football. Eric Tacosta for the first time in person on KVN. Well, first, we were very excited to bring Kyle back. You know, it was a great experience for us last year with Kyle, and I think Kyle would say the same. He's certainly a player that helped us quite a bit. I uh, love his mentality, uh, leadership, physicality that he brings, versatility as a player. Uh, I think it's great to have a veteran in the room, and uh, we do have a lot of younger guys. We have a lot of younger guys that we think have a lot of potential, uh, and we would expect those guys to reach their potential this year. We're very excited about really all those young players, and we've seen some quality play. We've seen some flashes of quality play, and uh, we're very excited, and we, we can't wait to get started. And there he is. There he is. So Brian McFarland put together, now that we have the full details of what his contract looks like, so this first year's cap charge is going to be $3.625 million, which Bobby is like about double of what he earned last year. <laughs> wow. And sometimes percent increases can be deceiving because 3.6 is for sure a fair price for what he's going to be bringing to the table in terms of leadership and um, and production. If he comes anywhere close to repeating, he had he had nine sacks with with while he was sitting on the couch for three games at the beginning of the season. <laughs> He definitely could have hit that 10, 10 barrier if he had For sure or very likely would have. So and, anyway, and outside people... of that, Sarah, just to tell the, the, the full scope he had. Yeah. So nine sacks, 30 tackles, nine tackles for loss, nine quarterback hits. Guy was all over the field. Right. And here, the way the Ravens set up the, the cap. So 3.625 million this year. Now the cap charge will go up to five point three seven five million next year, but look at the dead money; it's one point six. So this is one of those two-year deals that's like easily could be a one-year deal. Yeah, just in okay. case, just, just in, in case. case. He hits now, his if wall. he balls out again, just like he did last year, and you're like, holy, holy cow! Or, or let's put it this way: it almost doesn't even matter. If, well. Almost doesn't even matter if he balls out. What really will also impact this is David Ajabo and Odafe Owe, right? So if David Ajabo is healthy 17 games and takes that step of being what people once projected him being like a top 10 or top 15 pick, then yeah, you can you could maybe maybe cut him, although yep. you know, Kyle plays Sam. So they're gonna have to find a Sam. But um uh, but but that will be impacted also. But I mean, this is easily a one year deal if you want it to be. Yep. Smart. Yeah. Smart position to be in. What else we got going on here? Really, Let's really see. quick. Can we revisit Malik Cunningham? Since yes, we're taking this position by the... position, and then we'll get to the the fifth year option stuff. So um, this was very telling to me because we've yes. slightly talked about this in the past in terms of backup quarterback, and. Uh, Josh Johnson has already been named the starter. So, or excuse me, the backup, the primary backup for Lamar Jackson. Okay. So, but then um, the media asked him about Malik Cunningham because the media had seen Malik playing wide receiver a little bit towards the end of last season. I suppose they saw him in practice during warmups playing wide receiver. So they asked him, is he still projected to be a quarterback? Harbaugh says, this is very telling, that remains to be seen. We're going to take a look at him and see how he does. He's definitely developmental as a quarterback. He's developmental as a wide receiver too, but he's he's a good athlete in person. So um, uh, Bobby, I feel like the Ravens need to draft a quarterback, a backup quarterback. Obviously not in the first, first round, um, but – Johnson is is not your long term backup. Um, Josh is a career journeyman. He's a career journeyman. He's an exceptional and pro. Is prepared. He'll be ready, but he's not going to move the needle in terms of win and losses. No, and I and I just feel like they need somebody behind there. I mean, we've we've seen this 
movie before with with Tyler Huntley. I think it needs to be a, a step up from Tyler Huntley if you can. I mean, this is obviously ideally that's that's what you want. Now, what you can get is another as another thing. But um, I, I just feel like there needs to be a young guy in there developing underneath Lamar that is a legitimate uh, contender to be a backup quarterback. And when Harbaugh couldn't even commit to the fact that. Malik Cunningham is going to be a quarterback as opposed to a wide receiver. Mm -hmm. That makes me feel like, you know, he hasn't shown enough for them to feel like at least be, yeah, he's our number three quarterback, you know? Um, I just kind of found it a little strange that it's, it's almost that he's alluding to that. There's more work that needs to be done in terms of the evaluation of, of getting familiarized with him. You know, he kind of like suggested that we, we want to take a, a more of a look at him. Well, when, what, when what week did the they building. get him? What week did they get him last year? Well, it was yeah, it was late in the year. I, I can't remember the week, but it was definitely late in the season. So I mean, he'll probably get a lot of reps, right, coming up in these mini camps and all that. So they'll probably from that. And when they got him, like they're they're in playoff mode and probably isn't getting a ton of reps. Yeah. So maybe that's what he's referring to. Yeah. Um, but I would like them to draft a quarterback in, in one of the later rounds. And when we talked offline, I, I could, I can't disagree with that. I just, I'm intrigued by the untapped potential. There is the unknown of Malik. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I'm not saying to cut him. No, I'm just saying, it'd be, can we it'd, have a legitimate number three quarterback that you're confident is a quarterback? It'd be unwise to just, to not do that, to not bring yeah. in more competition. So let's see what happens during camp. Okay, let's see what happens over the next month because May 2nd is a deadline that we're all going to be closely watching and anticipating when it comes to the fifth-year option decisions that loom for Adafe Owe and Rashad Bateman, two former first-round picks respectively who are now entering year four. Eric DaCosta was non-committal, as you would expect, still weeks out from both the draft and also this May 2nd deadline on whether or not he will pick up the fifth-year options on both of these guys, Bateman or one of these guys. Bateman comes in at, we've talked about this, but Bateman comes in at $14.345 million, and always would be $13.251 million. The actual quote was, we'll have more to say about that after the draft. May 2nd deadline, Sarah, what are your thoughts? I think you are muted. But sorry. I guess I'm sorry, guessing sorry, I already I know what you're saying. Thank though. you. Thank you. Thank you. I cough <laughs> and I muted myself. So, um, yeah. So same as it's always been Rashad Bateman. I don't feel like I would give the fifth year option at 14 million. Uh, I just don't feel like he's shown enough. And maybe that's because of injuries. If he starts to ball out, then maybe you can try to resign him during the season. But I would not do that at this point. Odaf neither one is like a slam dunk. Oh yeah. Do the fifth year option. Like, like Lamar Jackson was. Um, but Odafe Owe, while it's not a slam dunk, I would probably lean towards doing it. Yep. No disagreement there whatsoever. Okay. One more clip from the press conference, and it was John Harbaugh talking about the hip drop tackle that has now been banned. That was one of the league's decisions. I don't think it was unanimous. Was it unanimous? I can't remember if it was unanimous or not uh, around the league, but John's. Uh, <laughs> You would have thought it was unanimous based on the way that John. He was kind of compelling. I kind of. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it was kind of compelling. Listen, Let's listen to, to the, that. the nuance and the technique talk here uh, of the way that John Harbaugh talks about it. And remember that his star tight end season ended because of this now banned technique. As far as the hip drop tackle, the challenge of tackling, I don't, I don't even understand the question. I mean, the hip drop tackle. When did you ever hear about the hip drop tackle until like two years ago, three years ago, right? That's because it was discovered probably in rugby and started being executed as a, as a standalone technique. It's a three-part movement. You've got to execute that play. You've got to be close enough to that, ta that ball carry to actually get him around the hips, all right, pull him close to yourself, swing your hips through, and drop on the back of his legs. If you're that close, wrap him up and tackle him and take him to the ground like Ray Lewis used to do and everybody did for 100 years before that. But you're talking about a tackle that the, 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 the ball carry has no method of escape from. He can't escape. So when you drop down on the back of his legs, it's a mass, and it's 25 times more likely to have a serious injury. So it's really a, a bad play, and it needed to be out. And guys are going to tackle just fine without the quote-unquote hip drop tackle um, because they tackled just fine without it for 100 years of football before that when you never saw it, really. So 
That's my answer to that. 25 <laughs> times more likely to get injured? That's a lot of times. That's a lot of times. No, but I thought what was most compelling is he was saying that, like, there's a three-part set. What are you laughing at over there? I'm just My guy, you know, they're going to be tackling just fine. In other words, don't be bringing that into my training camp this summer, or else you're going to get booted out of there. <laughs> well, and I do think it's telling because when I hear – listen, I think it's going to be tough, the toughest on, like, these smaller defensive backs. When you got like a five eight five nine defensive back, and he's got to bring back Derrick Henry, like it's going to be harder on them. Yeah. But I thought what was compelling is a if if I'm assuming he's correct. I don't know the history of the hip drop tackle, but if he's saying that this is like a new development in rugby, and people weren't tackling like that before, like you didn't even hadn't even heard of it, and so like we'll be fine. You know, if that's true, then yeah, okay. If like that, it's only a bit a new thing the last couple of years, but he said it's like a three part kind of move for it to hit all the elements, right? Like yeah. you have to, first of all, grab them, wrap your hips. I mean, wrap your arms around their waist area and then, and then completely dead weight yourself on top of like on yeah. it. And so it's like, to his point to even wrap up that way to put all your, and then drop your hips and have all that weight. To his point, for that to happen, you got to be close enough. And so if you're close enough, and it was certainly the case in the Mark Andrews injury, you could have just tackled him without doing that. Like you were there, you could have just hit him laterally rather than like, you know, you know, hang on for your, he wasn't even hanging on for his life. Like it, it just, he, it was that it was, he dropped his hips and put all of his weight back there. So, um, this wasn't an undersized DB either. No, Logan this was Logan Wilson is 6'2", 245. That's a big dude. Bengals linebacker. You don't, yeah. need, you don't need to be doing that. Yeah. And you like know? I said, I was already pretty convinced when I saw Bart Scott vehemently argue against it coming from a defensive player, a linebacker that I feel like if it was really cheating the defensive side of things and making it a million times worse, I feel like Bart Scott would have no problem saying that. And, but he went the other way, calling it dirty. Like, and stood by that when people were like, whoa, 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 don't call them dirty, you know? NFL so. owners did as well. It was unanimously voted on okay. uh, during the owners' meetings a couple weeks ago in Orlando. So there you have it. Lacey pulling an Instagram story screenshot <laughs> from the birthday boy <laughs> yesterday. Roquan Smith turned 27, and you grabbed this because I'm sure I you I love were. that picture of Roquan because when we Look at him. pulled a picture of him yesterday, we had, like, the Roquan we know, right? Like, the – the the enforcer the the guy that's like i'm locking the gates and whatever but look <laughs> that and the lamar picture she's just like so cute that makes me bobby i'm a little bit old maybe one more kid one more kid because yeah. my youngest is now seven and i'm like i don't know i i need these kids <laughs> around i i wish i'll just say this i went into my marriage or i grew up wanting five kids and i think because i got started a little bit later only quite had time for four, but oh, if I could go back, I would do one. Look at that. How do you love those kids? I need babies around, Bobby. I need I'll babies just, around. It just makes life happier. I'll just say this with our offline conversation, you made me feel at ease, even though we're different genders, right? Different biological clocks, so to speak. <laughs> you made me feel good that your first came at age 29. 29. Yeah, I am 29 yeah, yeah. At, the, at this time. You got plenty. And, and I would like a big family one day, too. Maybe I'm not sure about five, but four would be good. Yeah. Four You've be always good. been on four. I know. I know it. <laughs> well, yes, we do have other conversations aside from football, <laughs> don't we? Don't we? And we do. And we do often. Matter of fact. Yes, we do. We do often. A couple super chats have come in throughout this uh, this lunch hour. Not it's, it's late lunch. Late lunch hour live stream. James Green, thank you for your donation. Our guy Thor, some Iceland currency. Hopefully that translates over for uh, uh, for U.S. dollars. And Thor checks in with. All he wants, all he wants from the draft is a new franchise left tackle. That's not a nice currency, is it? Is it? What's ISK? Let's see. Doing this on the fly. What is it? Oh, no, it is. Okay. Yeah. I, was I, just, didn't say, recognize, from Iceland. I just didn't recognize Thor's, Thor's profile picture. He's got there. a new picture, I think. It's a, it's a, it's a cut sleeve jersey. Is that an Orlando Magic jersey? You got to let us know, Thor. Oh, anyway. But Thor, just so you know, it's a chance they do. 
But that that future franchise left tackle, if they if they get it this year, will likely at least start week one, not at left tackle. Yeah, right. right. If Stanley is is healthy, which you never know. You do never know. You kind of roll the dice know. there a little bit. Yeah. Hey, before we go, we'd love for you guys to join us for our inaugural Ravens Marathon Draft Party live stream coming up on Thursday, April 25th, coinciding with opening night of the draft. It's at Soundstage, a legitimate concert hall venue in downtown Baltimore in the Inner Harbor, right across the street from Power Plant, for those of you who are familiar with it. Tickets are available right now on Ticketmaster in the show notes below. 40 bucks gets you in. That includes premium tailgate buffet and dinner provided by Clean Cuisine. It's going to be streamed on YouTube for those of you who are outside the area. We'll also do it on Twitter and X probably as well, just so that we can get as many of you involved. And Sarah's flying in from Columbus for it. So we would love, 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 love to have you. And it would mean a lot for us uh, just on the back end of things to make a great first impression with a legitimate venue. So if you don't have plans, if you're looking at it, tickets are still available. If you're considering coming out, we would love to have you. It's going to be a great night, 7 o'clock, right up until when the Ravens pick. And then analysis will come, obviously, throughout the weekend based on how they handle their scheduled nine. I think nine total picks right now is where they're at. Hey, we never talked about the questions that were not asked that were kind of a little Uh bit. Thank you. Okay. Why can somebody please at these press conferences get an update on Keaton Mitchell's injury situation and just a general projection of when he'll be back? Give me a month. That was mind boggling. Like, like, yeah. Why were he sitting there talking about running backs and drafting one and nobody, nobody wants to ask? Hey, yep. how's Keaton Mitchell doing? We literally, we've had, we've had an end of season presser. We've had owners meetings, owners meetings. Yep. And we and had the pre-draft a, a sign. Who was the, Oh, King, uh, Derek Henry, Derek Henry signing. running back by the way. So it's a pertinent question again. Why is nobody asking yep. what his update is? Right. That's one we would have asked. So if we were at the press conference, we would have wanted to ask about Keaton Mitchell's timeline. While on the conversation of running back, I don't know what you'd get from this, but it would just be cool to to at least pose the question of an update on JK after what happened in Kansas City with him, reportedly, you know, kind of being used. Well, not even at least have asked that this offseason. That's been asked. That's been asked. But not since the visit to Kansas City. So it'd be nice to at least be like, are you still in touch? Okay. Maybe something okay. like that. Okay. Then with all the free agent wide receiver visits that have taken place reportedly, Josh Reynolds, Deontay Hardy being the latest Reynolds is off the market. Michael Gallup still on like at least like, Hey, what have come of those visits? You know, checking in on, on what the, the mid tier or even what's, what's a better word than I've, I've been trying to think of this live since we've been on, you have your first tier mid tier. Where are we now in free agency? Like, What's a good word to describe like the lull of free agency? It's like the how about how about the back end of free agency? Sure. We're at the back end of free agency, and it would be nice to have an update on that. Well, based not on all only those visits. not only that, but like there were no like, and maybe it's because Joe Ortiz wasn't there, and they didn't bring up somebody to kind of like um, they didn't bring somebody to pl- to play that Joe Ortiz kind of role. But there was no like. Hey, give us an evaluation of this player or that player. Do you yep. know what I mean? Like that yep. happens almost every year. Somebody will ask, "Hey, so for example, we we had yesterday that the the most often projected pick to the Ravens according to PFF was Adonai Mitchell, right? And so it's like, "Hey, so and so Mitchell or Mims or somebody is projected the Ravens, you know, like what's your scattering report on him?" There were, and then, there was no individualized content. Nothing. And and you're right. You know, you just you just brought that up like this for the first time in however many years. Joe wasn't sitting right next to him. Right. And Eric was asked a question about that. And he said it's weird. Like oh, it is sure weird. It is. And this is his 20th straight year of running the draft. But his right hand man is no longer there, who's who'd been there since ninety eight or something like that. And Joe Ortiz, he's now the GM for Jim Harbaugh in LA. So instead of the three guys up there, it's just John and Eric. And, and you wonder why, why, why didn't they go individualized? I don't understand that. Yeah, no, there was none of that. So it just felt like, um, 
Yeah, it just felt like they were more going the route of tell us about the cornerback class, tell us about the running back class, tell us about this class. And it's like, well, we kind of already have a feeling macro, for all of that. Very macro level stuff. Yeah, which is fine, but I feel like we kind of already know that. Like we and we've already heard, by the way, like Eric DeCosta say, yeah, this is a deep draft for offensive linemen and wide receiver. Like we've already heard that. So like let's let's dig deeper. Um so anyway, yeah, and it's it's just kind of funny cuz you know, like the lead quote that we're like w- that we led with with this show wasn't even asked. It was just Harbaugh off the cuff, oh, you yeah. know. And so anyway, <laughs> I just felt like there was some stuff, some meat left on on the bone. Definitely. Definitely. Again, har- the, the whole purpose of this episode was built off of a question that wasn't asked. Yeah. Harbs couldn't it was chomping at the bit that he had to mention he had to mention it and, and went off script. He was asked asked about Malik Cunningham, answered that question, and then moved forward on on what was on his mind. Yeah. So, well, with that, I guess we'll jump. It's a beautiful day here in Baltimore. It's like, yeah, I actually got. I should have said I need to roll like ten minutes ago. I lost track of time. Yeah, you got to go. I got to go. You got to go. So with that, we will both go. We appreciate you all for joining us. We will be back in our new format tomorrow, the Ravens Lunch Hour live stream at twelve noon Eastern. If you've been enjoying it. Hit us up. We'd love some feedback at BaltimoreRavensVault at gmail.com. Like this video if you enjoyed the live stream. Subscribe to The Vault on YouTube and wherever you get your audio-only podcasts if you haven't already done so. Special thanks to Primary Residential Mortgage for sponsoring this episode. And for my co-host and partner, Sarah Ellison, I'm Bobby Trossett signing off from this Tuesday live stream. We'll catch up with you in about 22 hours from right now. Later.